Secretary General, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to CNBC. Thank you so much for, uh, for talking to read, me and having me. Well, I just read an article in Politico, and the title of that article is NATO Names Panel to Find Its Brain. Now, aside from finding that offensive, as I do and I'm sure that you do as well, one wonders, isn't this the opportunity for NATO, a 70-year-old organization, to prove its relevance in the world today by tackling the pandemic? Well, first of all, this is a health crisis, uh, and NATO's main uh, objective, main task, is to prevent this health crisis from becoming a security crisis. We have to make sure that uh, uh, terrorist organizations, potential adversaries, are not taking advantage of this situation because the threats and the challenges we face in the security uh, domain doesn't disappear because of the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Having said that, uh, uh, NATO has a role to play to support the civilian efforts uh, to deal with this uh, health crisis, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, NATO allies uh, provide support to each other. Just today, a plane, a military plane from Turkey, uh, landed in, uh, in Italy and uh, Spain with a significant amount of uh, equipment, uh, and that's part of the coordinated efforts by NATO to mobilize support from different NATO allies uh, 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 dealing with this, uh, this uh, health uh, uh, crisis. Uh, so, so we are working together, NATO allies have to work together, uh, and the military are playing a key role across the lines, uh, supporting uh, the civilian efforts with uh, everything from controlling border cro uh, crossings to uh, disinfecting public spaces uh, to setting up uh, field hospitals. So military capabilities and NATO uh, are helping in a significant way to fight the uh, uh, corona crisis. We've seen so far, though, a pretty uh, consistent and uh, cohesive failure on the part of European countries to work together, at least in the initial stages of this pandemic. And NATO is, as you say, full of formidable tools um, at its disposal. You have the ability to command thousands of people, and we're not just talking soldiers, but we're talking about medics, doctors, nurses. Doesn't it make sense that NATO members should authorize you to take a bigger role in trying to tackle COVID-19? As we all provide support and help, and, and, uh, and uh, of course, what NATO's main task is in a way to mobilize resources from nations. And, and, and of course, nations are now also focused on their own needs because this is a crisis which, which affects us all. Very often when we face a crisis, it's a crisis which is only face, uh, affecting one or two or, or a limited number of nations, and then, and then the other nations can provide support. This time is a bit different because everyone is affected. Uh, so what we are uh, calling on allies to do is, of course, to see if they have any spare capacity. And actually, quite uh, a few allies have spare capacity and then allocate these spare capacities uh, to uh, 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 other allies. Germany, for instance, have uh, uh, taken patients from, uh, from, uh, from Italy and from France and uh, given them treatment at uh, hospitals in uh, Germany. The Czech Republic have provided equipment uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Spain and Italy. So, so there are many examples of how we help each other. We will have a, a foreign ministerial meeting in NATO tomorrow, and there we will discuss how we can step up and speed up our efforts to do even uh, more. So uh, military uh, capabilities are already important, but of course we can uh, see what more we can do, because this will last, this will take time before we're able to call off all the measures uh, needed in the fight against uh, the crisis. That meeting that you're going to have of foreign ministers, um, walk me through what you see coming out of that conversation, because at this point you've already got, you know, over 30,000 people in Europe have been killed by COVID-19. More Americans have died from COVID-19 than died in 9-11. That got you guys into Afghanistan. Would it make more sense at this point for NATO to take a bigger role in its own backyard? Well, I, I expect that the foreign ministers will do several things. First of all, they will demonstrate unity, in, in, uh, both in by, uh, by declaring uh, strong political support to each other in a very, 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 very difficult time. But, of course, actions speak louder than words. So I also expect them to see how we can further step up and speed up uh, our uh, joint uh, efforts. This is a common enemy, a common invisible enemy, and I have to uh, provide common uh, responses. Then I also expect them to uh, address the issue of uh, disinformation. We, we see that uh, uh, some examples of disinformation, we have to make sure that we 
uh, avoid a situation where this is uh, the situation is uh, is misused or taken advantage advantage of by by others. And 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 thirdly, we have already started to look into more long-term consequences. What does this mean for resilience for? our society's ability to deal with uh, mass, mass casualties. Uh, NATO already has guidelines, requirements for nations, but I think that this crisis illustrates the importance of updating, uh, revising, improving those, uh, those uh, guidelines. What will you say to those who look at what NATO is doing today within the context of this global pandemic and the fact that for years now the United States has been pushing NATO states uh, somewhat successfully uh, to meet their 2% of GDP target. Um, given what we're seeing in terms of the threat uh, to global health at this point, many people would say all that money that we're putting behind NATO, wouldn't it make more sense to put it behind improving healthcare systems? So healthcare, not hardware. Healthcare is important, and I have been a politician for many, many years myself, and I know that it's always hard to prioritize, always how to, choose, uh, to, to make decisions about allocating additional funds to healthcare or education or, or defense. Uh, but at the same time, the threats we are faced with, they don't disappear uh, because of the coronavirus. Uh, I think also what we see is that uh, the military capabilities allies uh, are investing in has proven extremely uh, helpful uh, in uh, providing support to uh, the health systems, the civilian health systems, in dealing with the coronavirus crisis. You can just look at the United States, but also on the European allies, that uh, the armed forces are playing a very important role. Uh, so logistics, transportation, uh, field hospitals, uh, but also helping uh, to control borders and many other uh, tasks are now uh, conducted by uh, military personnel. You mentioned some of the threats that could be um, going unnoticed as a result of all of the focus that is quite rightly, obviously, on COVID-19 and the spread of this disease across the world. What are you most worried about? I will be careful uh, point out one thing, but what we see is that, for instance, uh, ISIS is still absolutely present in Iraq and Syria, and we have to make sure that uh, they don't uh, regain any territory or any uh, position because of the COVID-19 uh, 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 crisis. Uh, in Afghanistan, we have a very difficult but also uh, uh, historic opportunity to uh, create uh, conditions for peace. Uh, there is an agreement between the U.S. and Taliban, uh, and we need to seize this opportunity to create a real inter-Afghan negotiation, negotiation between Afghans to create a lasting peace and to do so, NATO has to stay in Afghanistan, be committed uh, to the peace process uh, there. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we see a lot of military activities uh, close to our borders. So we see uh, a snap exercise, an exercise by, by Russia. We see in, in, in the North Sea in Europe, uh, we have seen a significant increased um, Russian uh, military presence in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. So, so we have to make sure, and we are making sure, that NATO uh, continues to provide deterrence, defense, that our operational readiness is there, that our missions in Afghanistan, that our presence in the eastern part of the alliance with battle groups in the Baltic countries, all of that continues, because there should be no misunderstanding about NATO's ability to protect our close to one billion people, also uh, when we have uh, uh, to face a, a, a coronavirus crisis. And in terms of remaining vigilant, how worried are you specifically by um, what some have called um, bad Samaritans? We've got the Chinese and the Russians offering uh, medical supplies and medics. There's a lot of concern, frankly, coming from the national security community that potentially allowing folks coming in from China and folks coming in from Russia uh, to Europe and elsewhere could actually be counterproductive because they might not necessarily be there for strictly healthcare purposes. I think that it has to be up to nations uh, to decide what kind of uh, help they need and, uh, and how, uh, how they organize uh, the reception or, or how they frame and, and organize uh, the, the, the delivery of, uh, of that, uh, uh, that aid. For me, as Secretary General of NATO, the main focus is how can I mobilize more help from NATO allies so we can help each other? And how can I coordinate even more uh, the, uh, the efforts we do uh, together? That's my main focus. 
this is a common uh, invisible uh, uh, enemy, and therefore we need a common and coordinated efforts by NATO allies. But do you believe that that's a possibility, that Trojan horse idea, that we could end up getting ourselves in more trouble? First of all, we share intelligence, we share information between NATO allies, also uh, n n now with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, intelligence sharing information is always important, but especially important when we have difficult situations as we have uh, now. Uh, uh, we have to counter all uh, attempts uh, to, you know, uh, use this situation to, 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 to communicate or, or to, 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 to convey disinformation or, or propaganda. And I think the best way for NATO to counter that is to is just to in a way provide the facts uh, and be transparent, and also to rely on the journalists like you. Also, I strongly believe in the free and in free and independent press. Journalists asking difficult questions, checking their sources, checking their 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 stories, and by doing that, that's the best way to counter propaganda. And uh, and NATO believes in free and open societies, and the free and open press is part of that. And finally, sir, thank you so much for joining us. I have one last question on China. We know that the Chinese repressed information on COVID-19 and its spread in the early days, early December, if you will. Um, now it seems as if Chinese officials have gone from trying to blame this on potentially U.S. soldiers in that country, bringing the disease into the country, uh, conspiracy theories, and now they're saying that they tackled this better than everyone else after they've actually already put the global economy as well as their own at risk. How do you perceive the Chinese response to COVID-19? Considering when we were in Munich, the last time we had a chance to talk, you were trying to coordinate a NATO-led response to what you saw as the threat of a rising China. So we see uh, uh, a rising China. We see uh, the global balance of power is shifting because of the rise of uh, China, and NATO is addressing that. That's something new in NATO. Uh, it was a, actually a decision taken by leaders at uh, their uh, meeting in December that for the first time in our history, uh, we are actually now as an alliance addressing the consequences uh, of uh, the rise of uh, uh, China. Um, we have also seen examples of uh, uh, disinformation propaganda related uh, to the situation we face now. Uh, with uh, the corona or COVID-19 uh, crisis. And as I said, the most important response to that is the facts, or, or are the facts, and it's the truth. Uh, and, uh, and NATO provides facts, and NATO allies provides uh, facts, uh, and journalist free and independent uh, press is the best platform to make sure that uh, those who are trying to send the message of disinformation uh, are not successful in doing so, because uh, when we have a free and independent press, uh, journalists uh, uh, asking critical questions, propaganda will not uh, uh, survive. Or the truth will prevail. And the best answer to propaganda is not uh, propaganda, but it's the truth. We're all trying our best, as I know you are, sir. Thank you so much for joining CNBC. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.